The Christian life is meant to be a life lived in service, service of God and service of others. And it should come as no surprise to us that the Christian life is meant to be a life of service because that's what the Bible actually tells us. So if we look at uh, Ephesians 4, 11 to 12 as an example, we read, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up or literally just built. So... What we uh, see here is that uh, the Lord Jesus has given his church, the body of Christ, uh, different types of leaders, Uh, apostles and prophets. uh, They don't exist now. They did certainly in the New Testament church, but we have them speaking to us in the words of the New Testament. The evangelists, those who are focused on reaching the unbeliever to help them to become believers, the uh, pastors and teachers, those who are focusing on looking after and tending the flock, uh, helping believers to grow. Uh, Notice that they are not to do all the work. They are not the only ones responsible for service. No, their job is to equip all of God's people so that all of God's people are using their different gifts and their different resources to serve, Uh, to serve to the end of helping the body of Christ to be built Uh, The body of Christ, again, referring to uh, Jesus' followers. Uh, So there are two main ways in which this body is built through our service. It's built as we help unbelievers to become believers, and so the body of Christ grows in size. But it's also built as we serve one another and encourage one another and help one another to grow in our maturity and strength as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice, all of us. Uh, to serve to that end. God has given all of us gifts, talents, abilities, resources to be used to that end. Even if you think you have nothing to contribute, you do, okay? And it should come as no surprise to any of us that the Christian life is meant to be a life of service because the one we follow served. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man, Jesus says, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, Jesus describes himself here as the Son of Man. Uh, The Son of Man is a figure we read about in Daniel chapter 7, who is given all authority and glory and rule by the Ancient of Days, God the Father. Jesus says he is that Son of Man. Indeed, we know he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he's more than just a great king. He's God the Son who took on human flesh. And if there was ever anybody in the history of the world who deserved to be served by others, it was Jesus. But notice, he came not to be served, but to serve. How did he serve? By giving his life as a ransom for many. Uh, Friends, all of us have a big problem And it's this, we were created by God to serve him. But our sinfulness causes us to serve ourselves instead of serving God. Instead of serving others as we're called to, we serve ourselves. That's sinfulness at its heart, a refusal to serve as God has called us to serve. And we deserve punishment for that. But Jesus served us by taking that punishment, by being our ransom by paying the penalty that we all deserve so that we can become part of the people of God again, so that we can be forgiven and have assurance and have hope. And now that we have been forgiven, what are we called to do? To follow the example of our Saviour and to serve. Okay, The Christian life is a life where we are meant to serve, to serve God and serve others to help the body of Christ to be built. Now today, we are going to focus on Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 10 through to chapter 4, verse 23. And the reason why I'm talking about this issue of service is that this theme of service is really at the heart of this section of Nehemiah that we are looking at today. Uh, It's a section of Nehemiah where we see uh, the people of God serving by working hard to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But before we look at what this section teaches us about service, and it teaches us three very important lessons about service, let's first of all put all of this into the context that we heard about last week. 
So remember, it was 445 BC uh, when Nehemiah comes onto the scene in Nehemiah 1. And uh, last week we discovered that he was a Jewish man living in Susa. Uh, Susa was in the eastern part of the Persian Empire, some 1,500 kilometres away from Jerusalem in the west. Uh, Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, had uh, uh, gone to Susa. He had reported to Nehemiah that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down, the gates were still burned down, that the people were in disgrace as a result of that. Now, Nehemiah worked for the king. He was a cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah realised, I think, that he might be able to speak to the king about this matter. But there was a problem because it was this actual king, King Artaxerxes, who had prevented the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt, who had prevented the gates from being re-established. And so Nehemiah prayed for four months about this issue, praying that God would fulfil his promises to his people that as they returned, that they would be more prosperous than their ancestors before them from Deuteronomy 30. And we saw last week that God answered Nehemiah's prayer. God God gave Nehemiah the opportunity to speak to the king and the king's heart was changed. He allowed the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem to occur. And so he sent Nehemiah back to lead this work. So Nehemiah travels some 1,500 kilometres back to Jerusalem to do this work. In the first part of our reading today, we were told Nehemiah took time to have a look around. Uh, in secret, looked around, saw what the damage was. But then he urged the people to act. And so our section today really focuses on how the people serve to rebuild this wall and to get rid of the disgrace of the people of Israel, how God's promises are fulfilled through this service. And there are three main lessons that emerge about service in this section. First of all, God values those who work hard serving him. God values those who work hard serving him. Uh, One section of our big section that uh, we're looking at today that we didn't read was Nehemiah chapter 3. And I think, to be honest, it's not the most exciting uh, part of the Bible. For in Nehemiah 3, we're just given this list of names of different people who helped to rebuild the wall. Uh, It starts with the priests, we are told. The priests, they lead the way by starting work on the sheep gate. And then Nehemiah 3 basically sort of works in an anti-clockwise manner and talks about all of those who helped rebuild this wall and all the gates. Okay, Uh, This is about four kilometres of wall that was being rebuilt. Okay, And so you have all of these different people who are listed. There are some interesting sort of uh, things that we read in chapter 3. There were some, uh, the nobles of Tekoa, who thought they were above this work and wouldn't engage with it. Uh, There was uh, one character, a a man named Meshullam, who actually appeared on Ezra's list of shame in Ezra chapter 10. Yet now here he is, helping to serve. Uh, There's a, a man who has a number of daughters. It seems like he didn't have any sons. Well, the daughters get stuck in and help rebuild the wall. Uh, It's interesting to note that none of the people in Nehemiah 3 are actually described as being builders. Yet here they all were, pitching in. Now, why is it that Nehemiah 3 is dedicated to listing all of these different people who worked hard rebuilding this wall? Now, it could be, humanly speaking, Nehemiah's way of honouring these people who joined with him in this task. But remember that uh, the words of Nehemiah 3 are not just Nehemiah's words. Ultimately, they are... God's word. And I take it what's going on here is that through Nehemiah, God is showing that he values the work of these people. He values what they have done. And as we're going to see, it was not easy work at all. Not only was the work itself hard, the context within which this work was going on was extremely difficult. God valued the work of these people. He valued the hard work of these people as they served in this way. And brothers and sisters, the the truth of the matter is, as we look at the New Testament, we see very clearly too that God values our work as we serve him and as we serve one another. Indeed, the Lord Jesus in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, and in the parable of the miners in Luke uh, 19, 11 to 27, uh, makes that point. 
Uh, both of these stories talk about uh, people who are entrusted with different things and meant to work hard for their master. And the master returns and those who have been faithful and have worked hard are rewarded. And friends, both parables, I think, are pointing to the idea that uh, God has equipped each of us with gifts, with talents, with abilities. He's given us resources. And as we use those things in service of him, as we are faithful stewards of those things and work hard in service of him, we can be assured of this, that we will be rewarded. Our hard work for the Lord will be rewarded. Now, here's the thing. We actually don't deserve any rewards at all. Because remember, we're sinners. We've been saved. And we're actually obligated to serve God as those who have been made by him. But even though that's the case, God graciously rewards those who serve him faithfully. Because God values those who serve by working hard. Now, I know for many of you, as we've uh, uh, emerging out of lockdown and you're thinking about the things that you used to do and you kind of think, oh, how on earth am I going to be able to do that again? Well, friends, be motivated by the fact that God values your hard work. Remember, we don't serve in order to be saved. We serve because we have been saved. We have lots of motivation to serve without thinking about the reward at all because we've been saved. How much more knowing that God values our work and reward it should we be to get stuck in? Okay, so first lesson out of Nehemiah 2, 10 to 4.23, God values the hard work of those serving him. But it's not just in church type ministry that God values that. Can I say, God also values the work that we do in our workplaces if we're working. Uh, have a look at Colossians 3, 22 to 24. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to carry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, uh, this is talking about slaves, but I think the principle spoken about here applies to us in our work context as well. Through our work, we can serve God and serve people. Well, you can't do that if you're a hip man, right? So, through good jobs, righteous jobs, we can indeed serve God and serve others. And the encouragement here is, as you work, um, don't think about the boss in the big office in the corner or whatever as being your ultimate boss. No, Jesus is your ultimate boss. And so in your workplace, work as if he is your boss. Okay? And know that he doesn't just value work that you do at church or in different Christian ministries, he values the work you do in that context in work and he will reward it, okay? Through your work, you have the opportunity to serve others well. Uh, through, you know, good quality um, goods or through good quality service, you can serve others well and help others. And God values those who serve by working hard, whether it's in Christian ministry, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in your home, okay? God values those who serve by working hard. Now, sometimes though, we can find it hard to serve. And uh, one of the reasons why we can find it hard to serve is because of our next lesson. And that is that serving God often leads to opposition and discouragement. Now, one of the amazing things I think about what happens in Nehemiah 2, 10 to 4, 23, is that the people rebuild in very, very difficult circumstances where they were opposed by some very dangerous people, really. Uh, let me give you some examples of this opposition that these people faced. So in Nehemiah 2, 19 to 20, we read, But when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, that is, the walls of Jerusalem were going to be rebuilt, 
They mocked and ridiculed us, says Nehemiah. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now, Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, uh, we believe that they were all governors of the regions that surrounded uh, the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, by the look of it, uh, they have their eyes set on having Jerusalem as their own. Uh, they don't like these pesky Jews uh, living in Jerusalem. Uh, they especially don't want them rebuilding any walls because that's just going to make it a lot harder to get Jerusalem for themselves. And so they turn up and notice they start a process of intimidation. Are you rebelling against the king, they say? Remember, the whole reason why the wall in Jerusalem had not been rebuilt was because the people around the Jews had complained to the king about the possibility of the walls being rebuilt. And they said, oh, these Jews, they're rebellious people or whatever. And so King Artaxerxes said no to the wall being rebuilt. And so here again is the prospect of a threat. We'll report this to the king. Is that what you're doing? Well, notice what Nehemiah says. The God of heaven will give us success. Why does he say that? Where is his confidence? Well, remember last week, he prayed for four months. God answered his prayer. The king said, go ahead and build. Nehemiah could see that God's hand was upon this. And so despite this intimidation, despite these threats, Nehemiah was quite confident this project would go ahead. But the opposition ramps up. So in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, we read, When Sambal had heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building... Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Uh, notice all the mocking that's going on there. Uh, you're hopeless. You can't really build anything good. Uh, what good could come of what you were doing? So there's all that sort of mocking. But notice so that things have ramped up a little bit in terms of the intimidation. Notice that the army of Samaria, the army of the peoples to the north is now just sort of standing around, not doing anything. Not attacking, but just there with their imposing presence. So here is all of this mocking, here is this intimidation. The aim is to strongly discourage the Jews from rebuilding. We keep going on. Chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. They kept going, the Jews. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Now that uh, these surrounding nations, these surrounding people see that the wall is growing higher and higher and that their chances of actually being able to take Jerusalem are getting less and less because of it, they move now from intimidation to plotting. They plot to come and fight against the people. Now, uh, the Jews hear about this and what do they do? They pray to God. They come before God, they pray, they acknowledge that God is the one who can help them. But notice that their prayer is, is not followed by just sitting back and waiting for God to do something. Notice they pray and then they post a guard. Okay? The idea of prayer, friends, is not to just sort of, you know, okay, I'm just going to pray and okay, God, just make it all happen and I'll just sit back until it happens. No, 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 we're meant to be acting. 
So, you know, Lord God, please give me opportunities to speak about the gospel. Doesn't mean that I just uh, sit back and wait for someone to come up to me and say, can you please speak to me about Jesus? No, I, I seek to uh, speak to people about Jesus and some people will be open to that opportunity, right? So, so prayer is not just meant to lead to sitting back and doing nothing. And that's exactly what happens here. They pray and they post a guard. But notice that things are continually ramping up here. The opposition is ramping up. Uh, chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. Uh, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Uh, notice that there is now discouragement, a sense of being overwhelmed in verse 10 amongst the people of Judah. Here they are, they are working hard, but the energy is not so much there, right? Uh, the rubble, well, what can we, how can we use this to rebuild? You know, it's all getting a bit much. The plots of the enemies are coming out. We're going to kill them. And more than that, it seems that the enemies are actually leaking their plans to the Jews who live nearby. And these Jews who live nearby, these uh, enemies, they're what I would call the nervous Nellies. You know, they hear about all this and they run and they tell the people who are building, oh, it's all bad, it's all bad. Notice, 10 times over, they say, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Can you imagine being in a situation where everything just seems to be stacked against you? Okay, that's what's going on with these people. But the people keep going. They keep rebuilding. They keep serving despite all of these threats. Indeed, we see that uh, pretty much they keep going all day, all night. Uh, some of them have their swords with them while they're kind of building and all that sort of stuff. It's not easy building here. Okay, building at the best of times is hard work. All of this opposition, all of this discouragement makes it that much harder again. The temptation would be to give up, to stop rebuilding, to stop serving. Now, friends, as we serve today, we need to remember too that we will be opposed. The Lord Jesus in John 15 verse 20 said, Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. Uh, we are those who serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus' warning here is that if you follow him, if you serve him, you can expect to be persecuted, you can expect to be opposed as he was persecuted and as he was opposed. Jesus is very upfront about that. Doesn't sugarcoat it in any way. We are called to serve him, but expect opposition as you do so. Now, there is a sense where we're hearing a lot of noisy people speaking against the things of Jesus in our press and in other sort of things nowadays. I want to assure you they are a noisy minority. Some of them might be quite powerful, but they're still a minority. Okay, I don't think any of us here today uh, are any, under, under any kind of threat because we're meeting here today, are we? We're able to come here freely, we're able to meet, not a drama at all. Um, My guess is that most people in our society care neither here nor there about us. Some will be quite positively disposed towards us, but there is a very, very vocal minority who are opposed. Now, I think you'll find this minority, particularly in different parts of Sydney, not so much here. I went door knocking uh, about 10 years ago in the Northern Beaches. Oh, that is the hardest door knocking I've ever done. People were so rude. Uh, you know, so arrogant in the way in which they responded to us. I've never encountered that kind of vibe here, okay? So, yes, there is opposition, but don't be daunted by it. It's not as big as we fear it might be, okay? Don't be daunted by it. But we will be opposed, and there certainly are times in Christian ministry where we can feel overwhelmed, okay? It all just seems too much. It all seems too much. But despite this opposition, despite this sense of being overwhelmed, 
there is a way to help us to keep on serving. And this brings us to our third lesson from Nehemiah today, which is this. That God provides his people with the encouragement needed to serve him. Uh, And we certainly see this to be the case as Nehemiah uh, speaks to the Jews uh, just after his arrival there, after he's checked everything out, he says to the Jews, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So Nehemiah has turned up. He says, hey, how about we rebuild the wall? Now remember that King Artaxerxes had put a stop to this. Ezra 4 tells us that. And so as uh, Nehemiah suggests the idea of let's rebuild the wall, it wouldn't be surprising if the Jews' first inclination was, well, actually the king said that we can't. Uh, You know, we're not really meant to. What does Nehemiah do? He talks about how God has acted. How God answered his prayers. How God changed the heart of the king. How God's hand was at work to bring about the situation where the wall could actually be rebuilt. And so having heard about how God had acted and how God was being faithful in keeping his promises, what do the people do? They rebuilt. Okay, they rebuilt. And this vision of God being at work helping them helps them to keep rebuilding. Chapter 4 verse 6 says, even though there's opposition, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Why did they work with all their heart when opposed? Because they knew God was at work. It was God who had brought this project about. God's hand was at work and they were encouraged by the reality of what God had been doing to make all of this possible. It was God's work that encouraged these people to rebuild despite the opposition, despite how overwhelming it was. Uh, In Nehemiah 4, 14 to 15, so after Nehemiah has kind of posted guards and all that sort of stuff, and he kind of looks things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them, the enemies. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Two things I want to highlight here. First of all, remember the Lord, says Nehemiah, who is great and awesome. So you've got all of these enemies and yes, it's a bit intimidating, but remember the Lord. Remember what he is like. He is great and awesome. He is the one who created all things. He is the one who uses nations to conquer other nations. He is the one who changes the hearts of kings. Remember him. Remember that he is the one that you are serving. Remember that no enemy is greater than him. He is more powerful than all. Remember the Lord. Friends, we need to remember what God has done, but we also need to remember what he is like. That encourages people to keep on serving. Notice also that uh, the enemies became aware of the plot and that God had frustrated it. So Nehemiah points out to the people as uh, the plot has been frustrated, who did this? It was God who did this. He shows how God is at work in their midst at that time, thwarting the plot. And friends, Do we not see God at work in our midst today as prayers are answered, uh, as we see people coming to faith or whatever? Remember what God has done in the past. Remember his character. Think about how he is at work now. But also in Nehemiah 4, 19 to 20, then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So here is Nehemiah saying, just in case we do get an attack, the trumpet will be blown, everyone gather. What can you be sure of, says Nehemiah? 
our God will fight for us. Why is Nehemiah so confident about that? Well, because God had answered prayers four months long. God had enabled him to come back. He'd enabled him to start rebuilding. The plot had been thwarted, etc., etc. So Nehemiah, based on the way in which God had acted in the past, how he was acting now, what his character was like, was assured that God will take care of things in the future, even if the enemies do attack us. And brothers and sisters, when it comes to us serving today in times when we are opposed or when we are overwhelmed, they are all the sorts of things that we need to think about too. What God has done for us in the past through Jesus, what his character is like, gracious, compassionate, loving, kind, uh, patient, righteous, faithful, thinking about how God is at work in our midst today and knowing because of all that God has done and because of his character that our future is certain. And friends, we all have a responsibility to encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 tells us, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, the day of Jesus' return, approaching. We are to spur one another to, on to love and good deeds, that is, to serve, okay? Doing good, that's service, out of love for others, right? As we gather together, we're to spur one another on, we are to encourage one another, literally give courage to one another to keep on doing that despite the opposition we face. And what do we see from Nehemiah? Well, we encourage one another as we speak about how God has been at work, fulfilling his promises. And do we not see that clearly in Jesus, friends? The one who died in our place in fulfilment of God's promises. Uh, As we look at what God has done in the past, do we not see the amazing character of God being revealed? And we see God at work answering our prayers today. We see God at work changing people today. And because of all of these things from the now and God's character in the past, we have confidence about the future. And you know what? That's our task when we gather together to encourage one another in those things, to remind one another about what God has done in the past, what he's like, what he's doing now and what he will do in the future. And we need to gather together to do that. So those of you at home, let me be blunt. If you're healthy, come back. We need you. Okay? We need you and you need us. Because we are all meant to be serving. And we need encouragement to serve. And it's as we gather together as the people of God that we have the opportunity to encourage one another to serve in that way. Now, when we're outside after service, after service, what are we talking about? Are we encouraging one another? Are we spurring one another on to love and good deeds? See, when you're down here, you hear me doing it, but are you doing it for one another? Okay? That's a really, really important part of our time here, where we actually do that for one another. We're all called to serve. And when we're opposed, and when we feel overwhelmed, and when we feel tired, we need to be encouraged to serve. So let us devote ourselves to doing that, to meeting together, not just meeting together, but encouraging one another when we do.